Hey guys. Well, we're going to go a completely different path again this week. Um, we're in Christmas holidays at the moment and we haven't even gotten through New Year's Eve yet, but it's the time of year when a lot of people probably start thinking about whether they want to go back to their same job, whether they want to change careers. Um, majority of us are going back to office jobs, something like that. Our guest tonight, his office for nearly the last 20 years has been a little bit more interesting than the normal office. He's been a game manager and game ranger um, through different parts of South Africa. He's seen a lot and experienced a lot. And unlike most of us, He's been in a lot of life-threatening situations. His name is Donovan Peel, and he's been kind enough to spend some time with us uh, today to chat about his life as a game ranger. So um, let's enjoy this one. Donovan, thanks for being with us. Oh, thank you. Pleasure. Uh, <clears throat> it's, it's definitely all mine. It's uh, nice to be yeah, in, in Melbourne visiting and, and catching up with you and uh, hopefully being able to share some of the experiences with uh, all your listeners. Donovan, how long ago was it that you got into working in, in these game parks? And is that the correct term? Because game sounds like you're hunting them, but you're, you're not hunting these beautiful animals, are you? You're protecting them and showing the world them? Yeah, that's 100%. So um, a lot of the places are called game reserves, or you have uh, nature reserves. So um, the, the places I basically worked on was, was game reserves, and that's just uh, really a name for a um, mainly fenced-off area. Uh, so it would be a perimeter fence, and then you'd have a sort of quite an expansion of land that would house different uh, sort of game and animals, some of them big five, which would be... Uh, lion, leopard, elephant, buffalo, and your rhinoceros. Um, but other game reserves wouldn't, would just have plain game. Um, and that's just your general antelope. And, uh, you know, you don't have any of the big five species on those properties. So, Donovan, how can you just tell us the names of a few of the places that you worked, some of the reserves? And can you just give the listeners an idea of how large these places are and how many animals they may have on them? Okay, so it's it's the first reserve that I worked in was in, uh, so the larger area of the reserve was about 60,000 hectares. But in saying that, it was open uh, to the Kruger National Park. And the Kruger National Park is in a facility of about uh, 2.3 million hectares. So the animals are free to uh, come and go as they want. You know, there was only perimeter fences around the Kruger Park. And the first game reserve that I worked at was at a lodge called Sabi Sabi, which was then part of the Sabi Sands, uh, which was part of the 60,000 hectares. Um, but, yeah, pretty much free. So, the, you know, your general game as well as your um, your bigger species could move around the 60,000 hectares if their territories allowed them and then you'd also have new animals if they were kicked out of the bigger Kruger Park area could move out of that 2.3 million hectare and then find themselves in the smaller area where Sabi Sabi was situated. What do you mean kicked out? Um, do you mean well, could you give us an example of, of how, how animals would be kicked out of certain areas by their own kind? Yeah, so a lot of the animals have territories, um, you know, especially with the cats, your lions, uh, leopard, cheetah, um, they have territories. So once once they are, you know, once your pride, especially with the lions, when, they, when the youngsters are born, um, the males in the area won't, in that, in that pride, won't really tolerate them for too long. And they would be then kicked out of the pride, um, anything from 18 to 2 years old. They would then have to go and try find an area where they can establish themselves and 
um, in turn get their own pride together. But a lot of the time they would find other dominant males in that area. And, you know, the dominant males wouldn't allow them to establish their prides. So they would be forced out into areas uh, that could be, you know, 10, 20 kilometers away from where their initial pride was that they were born to. And uh, so that's where they would be kicked out of the area. Um, and leopards would do the same, not really tolerated by other leopards in the area because it's got a lot to do with food and obviously mating rights of other animals, you know, of the same species in that area. So they're born into a, a pride or a herd. How does it how does it then work that even though they're sort of part of a family that they're then kicked out? Is it just that's just how it works? Yeah, so it's mainly with the males. Um, you know, a lot of the females. So, for instance, once again, lions, because they have a pride structure, the females will generally stay together and they would then increase the size of the pride. But the males are the ones that need to go and establish their own territories. And they have to establish their own pride. So a lot of that would be taking over of a pride. So they would then kick the dominant male out of that area and then take over the pride and then obviously mate with those females and have their own cubs. So nature itself keeps it this way so that you don't have inbreeding of cubs being born, taking over the same pride, and then that those males becoming dominant and end up mating with their um, sisters and mothers and aunts, um, and then that would just weaken the genetics. So they are kicked out and helps the genetic uh, chain sort of flow, basically. What sort of training did you go through to become a ranger? So it varies. Each reserve has different um, in-house training programs. Um, It has changed, but when I started, which was in 99, there was the Field Guards Association of South Africa, and you had to write exams. Uh, You had different levels. So you had level one, two, and three, and then you had the special skills level, which was the highest qualification at that time. And then each of the Um, reserves had their own in-house training program and that really it was although a lot of it was concentrated on the game side of the aspect because obviously you were taking guests out you got a lot to do with the lodge and the hospitality side Um, so you spent time again working in the kitchen working in housekeeping and then obviously your final destination was um, actually being a game ranger where you would take um, guests out on vehicles and then take them out on safari so let's talk about the more interesting parts how dangerous is it at times to be one of these rangers dealing with obviously man eaters or potential man eaters and people of different levels of intellect and awareness of these animals oh that's a nice way to put it (laughs) You do have your your different types of, of guests that that come and visit, um, and it is it, it's a it's an incredibly exciting job, but also incredibly dangerous. Um, so you have to you always have to be aware. Although you might in in the smaller reserves see the same animals and get familiar with them and familiar with their territories, you can never ever forget that they are wild animals. Um, But your main concern is obviously your guests on the vehicle and the guest experience. Um, You know, the guests are coming, a lot of them are international guests, so they are spending a large sum of money um, and coming over for sometimes just a once-off life experience. So the most important thing as as a game ranger is to ensure that every time you take your guest out, Um, And every animal you see, you have to pretend that it is the first time that you have ever seen that animal. Um, So it's it's really so important. You can't get blasé about seeing even the smallest antelope. Um, You know, it's very exciting for the guests. 
And so much depends on how the, how the ranger actually brings that experience across. You can either make it or break it for that guest. So can you give me an example when it, it hasn't gone right for a guest, either one of ones that you know of or another one where the circumstances have been um, tragic? There have been one or two, um, luckily not, not where I was directly involved with, but there have been one or two where guests have been, unfortunately, you know, killed by wildlife. There have been some elephant encounters where guests have been uh, trampled. Um, but a lot, a lot depends on the, on the guide and how they handle the situation. And one of the situations that I was directly involved um, when I just started guiding we were tracking a big pride of lions um, in the area. They were called the Northern Pride, and there was about 22 lions, and they were um, basically led by a massive male um, in the area. He was probably in the vicinity of about uh, seven or eight years old, really, really big guy, and we were in a sighting. Um, Just on that, Donovan, how much do these lions weigh? So big males can be in the vicinity of uh, 160 to 200 kilograms, even heavier than that. Um, so they are definitely formidable. You know, they 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 stand. Um, if you're in an open Land Rover, they are probably the height of your of your door to where the window ends. Um, but when you're out on safari, you know, you're in a safari vehicle, so you don't have any. There's no roofs on the vehicle, no windows to wind up. They are open safari vehicles. So it's pretty intimidating when you have these huge animals walk right past the vehicle. They're incredibly habituated to the vehicles because, you know, you've got to understand they've been seeing these open game vehicles since they're cubs and they realize that the vehicles pose no threat to them. Um, but very often people on the back of the vehicles are, you know, they they can do very silly things and you know as soon as you sort of change the shape or make sudden movements um, that the animals aren't used to that's when they react and um, that's exactly what happened in this experience yeah so sorry sorry to interrupt there what what actually happened with this um, was it the northern pride that you guys were tracking so we yes it was so we had the northern pride we had found them they were walking directly towards us Um, I was in my open vehicle with my set of guests and uh, we were always trained that, you know, whichever side the animals were, you would face that side and turn around um, to chat to your guests and give them a bit of an explanation of what was happening with the animals. And this uh, pride of 22 lions is walking down the sand road toward to the dirt road towards us. And uh, there was a vehicle in front of us with another guide in that vehicle I was turned around facing my guests. Um, the majority of the females and cubs had already passed, and the big male lion was lacking a bit behind. And one of my guests pointed out and said to me, um, "She said, Donovan, what do you, you know, what is the guest in the other vehicle in front of us doing?" And as I turned around, the lady that was sitting at the back of the um, open vehicle in front of us had her arms stretched out with a piece of, um, so we get dry meat, which is like beef jerky. Uh, It's called biltong. She had a a piece of biltong in her hand, stretched out of the vehicle, and with her camera ready, with the hope in trying to actually let this lion take the dry meat from her hand and then get a photograph. I luckily managed to radio the guide in the other vehicle and inform about it, which he, in time... Uh, reprimanded this woman to get her hand back into the vehicle. It, it, it would have been a very different consequence um, and situation if uh, if this line had got any closer to her. So these safaris are, uh, I would assume, not very cheap, but they obviously don't do a um, an intellectual level test with some of these people with the way that they behave. Um, so that was a lucky one. Have you got one where someone wasn't so lucky? Um, we, on the reserve that, that, um, we worked at, we were, we were pretty lucky. You know, the, the guests before they went on a vehicle were given quite a strict orientation and we as guides and always rangers were driving the vehicle. We also had trackers that sat 
on the front of the vehicle. They had a special chair that was on uh, situated on the front of the vehicle. So a lot of the time between myself and the tracker, we would be able to monitor the guests. Um, but one of the other reserves, unfortunately, um, <clears throat> excuse me, their guests uh, went to bed. Hot, humid evening. Um, they were on honeymoon and the young girl decided to take her mattress and sleep outside um, of, of the tent and her boyfriend was unfortunately woken up by her screaming uh, and the the young male leopard had come in, basically pulled her off the mattress and was dragging her into the bush and uh, he was woken up by the screens. Unfortunately, um, he didn't manage to get to her and she, she was killed. Which which animal in the um, the reserves um, would you say is the most deadly in regards to people? Well, I think in general it it, it really depends, you know, in in the situation. But I think the the deadliest animal I think uh, generally in Africa itself would be the hippo. Um, You know, they seem pretty placid because during the daytime they're always in water. So when you drive past in a vehicle, you know, they would open their mouth as a threat threat display. But uh, very seldom do they come charging at you um, from out the vehicle. The problem is that especially throughout Africa, and uh, this is in not really in reserves, but in the rural areas, you know, a lot of the rural areas, there's no running water. So the villagers would go down to the water's edge to collect water, uh, to wash their clothes. And in the evenings, the hippos exit the water in order to graze. And then in the early hours of the morning, they would be returning. The villagers in turn used the paths created by these hippo. And, uh, you know, they would go and fetch water once again early evenings or, I mean, sorry, late afternoons or early mornings. And... Um, often would come and have confrontations with these hippos. And although the hippo wouldn't kill the and, and sort of eat the, the um, villagers or the people that they come across, but they are just so massive. They weigh in about 2,000 kilograms. So very often they're just trampled or bitten, and that's, that's how they'd be killed. You're dealing with these animals. Well, this is your job to show people these animals. How exciting and fascinating was it for you for this to be your day-to-day job? Stay with us. We'll be right back. If you want to learn how to be extraordinary and achieve high success and a winning mindset, comment on this episode, Ice Bath, at the Barefax Podcast on YouTube or at the Barefax Podcast on Instagram, and I'll give you instant access to my latest ebook. The top 10 benefits of ice baths for extraordinary results. Tip five is my personal favorite. Let me know what your top tip is. You know, it was amazing. It's, every day is completely different. Um, you might see the same animals because of the territories that, that they're in, but every day they would be doing something completely different. Um, and you are, you are so fortunate to to be able to have that interaction and, you know, just to be so lucky to be able to wake up and just, you have to remind yourself constantly that some people are, this will be a once in a lifetime experience for them to come out, to see elephant, to see lion, to see a giraffe, to see any of the antelopes. And you will be, you know, you're doing that day in and day out and, that is your job and that is what you've got to show. So you've got to show the people and that you've really, it is such a fantastic experience. It doesn't last forever, unfortunately. Um, you know, you do move into different positions, um, but while you're doing it, it, you are extremely, extremely lucky. Just on that, where do you fit in with the threat of poachers? So unfortunately, um, this is something I was involved directly with. On one of the reserves, we had uh, about nine 
white rhino. And the threat of poaching uh, increased and over the past few years, uh, we had security that were on the reserve that used to go around and, you know, check the fences and follow up on the rhinos. But unfortunately, one evening, um, it was just before midnight, we heard gunshots and responded to where the gunshots were. Um, and unfortunately, after searching, you know, for a few hours, we came out, uh, we came across a carcass um, that horn had been of a rhino that, and the horn had been removed. And it's not a great, it's not great. This, the female that was killed um, was probably about four months of giving birth. Uh, the fetus was, was removed from, and the horn was a bit too sm small, but the poachers still tried to chop it off and remove that tiny bit of horn. They also shot the other calf that was with um, this mother. Um, the calf ran away, so they didn't manage to get that horn, but unfortunately... Uh, the vet had to unfortunately put this uh, rhino down. It was shot by about, uh, about six times. So we were directly involved with that. And it's it's not a great experience when you, when you think to yourself that these amazing animals with absolutely no defense whatsoever are just, you know, shot so cowardly and um, just brutally killed for, you know, something like a rhino horn. Why are these beautiful animals killed, and what what are the what are the horns and the parts from these different animals used for? There's a lot of different speculation on on why um, they are. Uh, some of them are used for traditional medicines. Um, some of them, especially the rhino horn, is believed to be an aphrodisiac, and. Uh, also, they're used for ornamental, um, so a lot of the the sort of richer um, people in, in different areas, a lot of them uh, sort of from over east believe that, you know, to have an ornament carved out of rhino horn um, is, a, is a great symbol of power. Um, but unfortunately, none of that has been proven to be true, um, especially on the aphrodisiac side. There's no proof of that whatsoever. And it's, it's just about education. You know, people will have to be educated. So you've got education against tradition. Uh, so it's very difficult to change. How dangerous are these poachers? What sort of arsenal are they carrying with them? And what sort of defense do you guys have against them to stop them and also to defend yourselves? When we went out on patrols, uh, we were armed, um, so we carried rifles and we wore bulletproof vests. We were not allowed to, um, to engage with these poachers. We didn't have the right to, if we did see them, you know, to, to fire any shots with them. But, and, but you, it was just to, taken with, in case you did get into uh, the conflict, at least you had something to protect yourself. But you had to rely on the on the military or the police um, to come to your aid and assist you with that. A lot of the time they carry in high caliber rifles in order to shoot the rhino. And uh, they have got axes or machetes in order to cut the horn off. Over the years, it's it's gotten from sort of just your your local guys that have, have been paid quite a substantial amount of money to go into reserves and kill these rhinos. It's become more and more sophisticated as the money has got bigger and bigger. So you've had syndicates that are formed. Um, sometimes on the reserves, you know, in-house staff are paid to just give information about where the rhinos are. And, uh, you know, unfortunately paid for what they are earning um, to what they are paid just to give that information. It's quite a substantial jump. So... That it's a very difficult thing to nail down. There are so many people involved, and it's it's very dangerous. So, are any of the poachers ever apprehended, or are there ever any firefights between, say, the military and these poachers, or is it 
almost the fact of such huge areas that by the time um, authorities are responded to these poachers, it's it's all been and gone. So there, there definitely have been firefights um, between, and unfortunately in the Kruger National Park, some of the anti-poaching guys have lost their lives to rhino poachers. Um, they do as much as possible try apprehend these guys, but it is such a vast, vast area. Um, these poachers are exceptionally good at what they do, um, and they can they can really cover such massive areas. And the manpower that's needed to stop this is incredibly expensive, and it's a very dangerous um, job. So it's 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 very unfair to say that. You know, it's it's not working and the guys don't give it the all. A lot of the reserves just do not have the funding to pay for that that top um, sort of tier of anti-poaching. Um, so you do have the guys coming across and, and finding these weaker reserves and then taking the animals from there. But the unfortunate thing is when the guys that, the guys that do get caught – are really the bottom men. You know, they are just the guys that are coming in. They've been paid cash. Their job is to get the rhino horn and then to deliver it to somebody else. So the kingpins at the top of the food chain, um, it's incredibly t- it's difficult to try get hold of these guys. The numbers of these beautiful animals, are they severely depleted are they healthy are there programs to try and help regenerate where where is it at they they have definitely been depleted um the exact numbers i'm not 100 percent sure at the moment but definitely the rhino population in the majority of the reserves has been depleted i know for a fact the you know after the rhinos that were poached on the reserve that we had we had uh, four of the rhinos that were poached. We then dehorned the rest of the rhinos and we sold them off to a private breeder who um, had a quite a, a, a large number of these rhinos and they were protected 24 hours a day. So although we lost rhino from our reserve and our guests that came, they were no longer able to see them. If we had kept them on the reserve, we can almost guarantee that within three to four weeks, we'd have probably lost all of our our rhino. So we're hoping that the numbers sort of will will even out and the births will um, be more than what the the rhino poachers can take off. But it's incredibly difficult to say at this moment. Can you tell us about um, one or two close calls you've had with these beautiful animals, although you're there to show the world them and how beautiful they are and protect their environment. Have you had any close calls with them? Yes, I have. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always exciting when you look back and you tell stories like this, but at, at the time, um, I think my most, probably the most frightened, frightening experience that I had in all the time that I, that I spent in the bush was on Christmas day and we always had to, as as rangers, go and wake the guests up, um, which would then give them time to get ready. They would then walk through to the main lodge where we would enjoy a cup of tea and coffee uh, before we headed out on safari. And um, so I had the, the usual four o'clock in the morning, woke up, um, was walking to go and w- went down to the lodge, got the tea and coffee ready, went out to wake the guests up at five o'clock. And as I had knocked on the one guest's door, they came to the door to acknowledge that they had been woken up. And as I stepped onto the pathway, uh, two sub-adult male lions, probably 18 to 20 months, somewhere around there, 20, 24 months, came charging at me straight through the bush. Uh, They stopped probably about 10 meters from me. The pathway that I was on that led to all the rooms was made out of pebbles, out of you know, sort of stone. Um, I kicked the stone towards them and and shouted at them. They then stopped. Um, I just stood dead still in my tracks. And as they turned around and moved away, the big uh, dominant female, 
she just came charging straight through them and uh, she stopped probably about two meters from me. I once again just stood my ground, uh, clapped my hands, you know, kicked the, the gravel and the stone at her. She growled and flicked her tails and uh, eventually, what felt like a few minutes, which was probably only a few seconds, she then turned around and casually walked off. I then made it, watching her the whole time, uh, backed off, walked down the path, got the vehicle, drove around to collect the, the guests. And only when I drove around to collect the guests did I realize that about 20 meters from where I was standing, they had actually killed an antelope. And that's the whole reason for them charging me is that they were just protecting their, their kill. So uh, Christmas evening, my uh, when I got back to my accommodation, my wife was still happily lying in bed, not knowing what had happened. I was shaking and white and, you know, that afternoon telling the story to every, all the other guests, you know, I was quite relieved to still be around. But at that stage, I just, you know, all of a sudden your, your training and your sort of, thank goodness, the knowledge that you've picked up about the animals and what you should do, it, it just all falls into place. And without that, I wouldn't have been here without a doubt. So just a couple of questions on that. Was it unusual that they were in the area that you were walking through, firstly? Secondly, why on earth do you face them down and show them aggression back? Why wouldn't you run and why is running a bad alternative? And could you just break it down a little bit more how much fear must have you been going through when this happened? Well, I think let me just, you know, the let me just start off by the by saying that the lodge that we were working in at that stage um, was not fenced off at all. Uh, we had to keep the the grass inside the lodge area at a very short level so that you could obviously see if there were animals around. And because you kept the, the grass short, a lot of the grazers would come in and feed on that that grass. So we kept the grass watered in order to make it a sort of a pristine area and a, a nice looking lodge for the guests to walk around. So the food for the grazers was there and they would spend a lot of time, especially in the evenings, they would move in there and obviously feel a lot safer around the buildings. And uh, the lions had obviously just walked past the area and they opportunists, so they had seen um, they had killed a wildebeest, which is a type of antelope, and uh, they had chased the antelope a bit more into the sort of thick brush area, and that's where it was killed. And uh, so that's the only reason they were in the lodge. The lions itself, if they did ever come to the lodge, were really just passing through. They weren't in the lodge in order to hunt down a human or to you know track one of the guests at all they were purely there because they saw an opportunity with with this antelope that was in in the area and sorry i probably asked you way too many questions then why do you face them and stare them down even though i'm sure all your instincts say oh, i'm running i'm out of here it's exactly that your instincts do say get out of there um but you know, especially with the with the with the predators, you the first thing that anything that they chase, the first thing that that the prey does is turn around and run. And so, as soon as you turn around and run, you become prey, and that's what they are used to. Once you face them and you stand your ground, it is something that they're not really that used to. Um, and if you do sort of make yourself big and you know, make sort of odd noises. Like at that stage, I shouted and clapped my hands and screamed, raised my hands above my head, and also the kicking of the stones. I think it just puts a little bit of doubt in their mind that, you know, here is something that I've run up to and they are not running away. So they're not sure on, you know, the the danger that they would be in. So that threat display they didn't want to, they had no intention of, you know, attacking me to, to harm me. They were just protecting their kill. They just wanted to do, get me away from the area because they didn't know that I wasn't a threat 
uh, to their kill. They do stalk humans, though, don't they? And um, I believe your lovely wife was walking from one lodge to another when she was stalked and nearly attacked. Is that correct? That is correct. In the same reserve, um, we were visiting friends in that reserve. They didn't have guests for that evening. And sort of just an in-house rule was when you visited another lodge, you never really went up to the lodge. You would always just stay um, in the accommodation of the person that you were visiting. And um, anyway, we were busy visiting and my my wife said to our friend um, that she had never ever been up to their lodge. And he said, well, he needed to go and get something up and uh, at the lodge and, you know, make sure that everything was closed up for the evening. So the two of them took a walk up and about 20 meters before the lodge, it was cement on the floor so that the vehicles, when they drove in, would drive on the, on the cement. And uh, while they were walking up to the lodge, my wife heard sort of a strange noise and as she turned around, there was a lioness in full flight um, running towards them. Luckily, the, our friend was also a trained guide. He put my wife, be, uh, sort of pulled her behind and uh, did exactly the same, shouted, screamed, clapped his hands. The only difference was this female stopped and then kept on coming. Uh, came forward another two or three meters uh, went down into the crouching position. He said to my wife, she must just move off backwards, you know, up the stairs towards the lodge. He stood there and this went on for a few minutes. This must have been about two or three minutes where the, it was just a complete stay off between the two of them. Uh, eventually, uh, he, he, because of him standing on his ground, this lioness just turned around and ran off. When he, he, they came back, my wife was in tears he was incredibly nervous. He got back. We took um, torches and went out to go and have a look and physically found the tracks where she had come into the area and had physically been stalking them behind the vehicles. You could see where her tracks had gone and how she had crouched down uh, behind the vehicles, watching them pass and had made it all the way up to that area where she decided that was her chance and gave the full sprint to get to them. So in most jobs, there are accepted risks. Uh, nothing like this. I wouldn't say the word complacency would be appropriate, but are these just, are these things that you just accept with this amazing job? You also accept that there is the possibility of an attack from an animal or a threat from one of the animals. 100% you do you, you do accept it and you know when you when you sign up for this position and you go through your training courses one of the stuff that we did um, at Sabi Sabi is that the experienced guides that were training us uh, walk you into the big five so they on purpose um, will walk you into elephants um, just so that you can see the reaction that elephants you know would have or and or buffalo would have so that if it did happen to you at a later stage, it is not a new thing. Um, you know, obviously, a, a lot of the times you can avoid it. And as a guide, you do avoid it. There's a lot of pressure put onto the guides, and especially the younger guides and the newer guides, to get that extra meter closer. You know, because in the guiding industry, a lot of it is um, based on tips, so at the end of the stay, you will get gratuities from uh, your guests. And uh, so guests do, they, they push the envelope. They, they try and make you sort of get, you know, two meters closer to the lion or just a bit closer to the young elephant. Or And it's, it's very difficult as a new young guide to say no, you know, because the guests are paying a lot of money. You want to give them 100% experience. But all of that can be avoided if you just keep that distance between you and the animal, that safety zone. And, uh, you know, once you break that safety zone, then you, you're the one that's, that's um, sort of almost committed the crime, if you put it that way. And then you have to, you know, just expect the unexpected and what that animal is going to do. But if you keep that safety zone, 
the, the your safari experience will be absolutely amazing. You actually lived in the game parks, um, or the reserves, sorry, I should say. You had um, a number of uh, Rhodesian Ridgebacks. These were um, a domestic pet, but were they also something because of their breeding that could be used to help protect you should you come into one of these situations? So when we had a lot of the a lot of the big fire reserves um, don't allow you to have pets, um, especially the commercial ones. Where we got our dogs, um, I had them for for protection for myself when I went out and did the anti poaching uh, patrols with our guys. So they are definitely they were used for protection. Um, we were the reserve. This was the same reserve that had the the rhino on. Um, we did have lions that pass through every now and then, but we didn't have any resident lions on the property. But saying that, before we got the two Rhodesian Ridgebacks, we had a Staffy, Staffy Bull Terrier, and um, he was an amazing, amazing dog. You know, basically the same of, well, for the, you of you that don't know, was Jock of the Bushveld, the famous African story, the same breed of dog. And... Um, this dog was unfortunately killed in front of my eyes. Um, he was about probably three meters away from me on the edge of the water and was taken and killed by a crocodile uh, right in front of me. So although they are there for your protection, you have to realize that you know bush animals and, and, and dogs that you have in the bush, the, the chance of, of them living out their full life is not that great. You know, there are, there's lots of threats. There's snakes, scorpions, spiders. And uh, unfortunately, a, a lot of the people that do have dogs for protection lose them to wildlife. What do you miss most about the job? I think just the freedom, you know, the, the freedom and the beauty that you have, you know, just to be able to, a lot of the time it's, it was amazing to take guests out and, as I said earlier, to have people on your vehicle that, you know, the first time they see a giraffe or the first time they see a, an uh, impala, which is a, one of the most common um, antelope that you get, to just break down in tears because they have, you know, they've seen it on TV, they've watched it on, you know, the movies, The Lion King, they've saved up money and now they've come to Africa and they've they've seen this animal in real life in front of them. So that experience you miss. But then there's also the times where you can just get into a vehicle and just drive around by yourself. You don't have to explain to anybody. You don't have to do anything. You literally just drive around and just the freedom and the privilege that you have um, to be so close to nature and just to enjoy and, you know, just to experience it. That's one of the biggest things that I miss. Having a, a wife and now a son, did that did that influence your decision at all to get out of the industry, particularly when you were saying earlier on you'd heard gunshots and you had to put a bulletproof vest on and grab a rifle yourself and go out and see what was going on? Did those sort of dangers influence you getting out of the industry? I think without a doubt. You know, a lot of the a lot of the guiding, especially when you when you start off as a ranger, is definitely a single person's life you know you up early your whole concentration is is and your whole time when you're with your guests is spent for your guests but as you get older and uh, like myself I you know met my wife got married um, had our son he was had grown up in the bush and but then when you you have to weigh up the options of you know you've got a newborn child at home and three o'clock in the morning, you are leaving them and putting on a bulletproof vest and heading out to protect a wild animal. Um, you, you've got to weigh up the options. You know, is is that is it worth it and putting your family at risk, or going out and you know trying to protect an uh, an animal? Um, and it's a very difficult decision. But it plays a massive, massive part in uh, in the decision, especially that I made, is uh, and to to leave the industry that that really I loved and still am so passionate about. 
Speaking of protection and looking after yourself, you would have also in your time seen um, nature take its course with stronger animals attacking weaker animals. Um, I remember reading somewhere that that the famous David Attenborough, um, although he wanted to at times, never intervened to protect an animal. Did did that sort of thing ever go through your mind when you say you saw a beautiful impala or something like that being attacked and killed by a pack of lions? It does. Um, it really, really does. You know, you you've because you you just see how helpless they are against these um, sort of dominant predators. And you know, for anybody that's been lucky enough to to go on safari and and witness anything like that happen. It's um, it's an incredibly emotional um, thing to witness. You know, you 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 do have to understand that it's nature, and whether we were there or not, that those animals still have to eat. So the predators would have killed that impala or would have killed the giraffe, whether we were in a vehicle viewing it or if we weren't there. And um, you know, it, it, it makes me think of a story of that was written in one of the. Um, the books that the field guards get given and um, the story goes of a lady that went on on a safari and the guard took her and they saw a big dominant male lion that had been badly beaten up by two other male lions that had taken over the territory and the ranger explained to the guest on his vehicle he said this was the dominant male and he has been now ousted by another two um, sort of stronger males in the area. And, you know, it could be a day or two if this male doesn't eat, he's not going to be able to get his strength back. And the chance of him dying is very, very good. And uh, anyway, they went on their safari and got back to the lodge. The, all the guests left. And a few weeks later, the manager of the of the game lodge got a letter from this lady and she said um you know thank you very much i enjoyed my stay the lodge was amazing everything was fantastic the only thing that was a bit worrying is that we were taken out on safari showed this lion that was and the ranger said to us that you know if he didn't get food he would probably die within the next day or two he said yeah she said was there not a possibility that one of the antelope could be shot and then fed to this lion in order for him to regain his strength and the manager wrote back and he said you know thank you for your kind words about the lodge excuse me he said "Uh, we've taken everything into consideration we've had a meeting with both the lion and the antelope the lion thinks it's a fantastic idea we're just (laughs) finding it incredibly difficult to convince the antelope (laughs) Oh dear. Uh it does make you wonder, doesn't it, that uh the people some of the people that do come out on these safaris um stay in lovely lodgings, treated like kings and queens, and watch this amazing experience. Um do have to be reminded that the whole reason that these people are coming out there, correct me if I'm wrong, is to watch nature in its rawest uh rawest form. Yeah, hundred percent. You've um, you know, and you've got to you've got to remind them. As I said earlier, you know, a lot of the animals are habituated, so they've seen the vehicles and they are used to the vehicles. But it in no ways means that they are tame, or you can hold a piece of meat out of the back of the vehicle in order to try to feed them, or you can you know touch them, or they will let you take photographs, and you know they. But they also have bad days, so you could see. A very relaxed elephant, you know, two or three times, and the the next time you see him, he could just be grumpy, and you could have a totally different experience. We had um, two guests that had come over on honeymoon, incredibly energetic guests, and uh, they were from France, so the English was was pretty broken, and luckily they were the only two guests on my vehicle. And we had been driving around for a while and they were just enjoying the bush and really, you know, absorbing everything. And we saw giraffe in the distance. And so we stopped and they said to me, they said, oh, can we go to the giraffe? 
And I said to them, no problem, we will go to the giraffe. And all I felt was the vehicle moving and the two of the guests had got off the vehicle and were running as fast as they can towards the giraffe. Uh, I just, the area that we were in was, was, we didn't have any predators. So I knew there was no danger to the guests, but when I eventually caught up to them, you know, I, I said to them, what are they doing? And they were, you know, quite politely said to me, but they asked me, can we go to the giraffe? Um, you know, not, I mean, not understanding that I thought in the vehicle and they just simply <laughs> ran off to the giraffe. Could a, could a giraffe injure them or would a giraffe just run off? Look, 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, a giraffe would definitely run off. Um, there was an incident a few years ago in the, in the town that I worked in one of the other reserves where um, a mother and her young uh, boy were out on a, on a walk. The little boy was um, on his sort of little push bike, uh, one of the plastic bikes that you get, and he was a little bit ahead of the mom. And um, this bike on the gravel roads was obviously making a lot of noise. The giraffe mother was on the one side of the road with her youngster on the other side of the road and um a liter- everybody that uh, sort of had had gone and inspected the incident um had basically said the the mother was just trying to get back to the giraffe unfortunately this little boy was in the way and uh the mother giraffe just ran straight over the boy um started trampling him the mother then ran up. She also got trampled. And uh, luckily, both the mother and the, the youngster survived, but with serious, serious injuries. So these giraffe, although they are so placid, they can do a lot of damage. You know, hard, hard kicks. They are extremely heavy animals. So, you know, once again, something as placid as a giraffe can definitely cause injury. You spoke earlier about how you use these um, open roof Land Rovers and the animals are used to them. If they turn on you, what sort of what escape or what defence do you actually have in these vehicles? So when you do go out in the vehicles, the majority of the reserve, you are, you are trained on how to use a rifle. Um, so especially in the areas where you have dangerous game, you do go out with a rifle in the vehicle and you've got a special rifle holder that is mounted onto the dashboard of the vehicle. Um, So that is there for your protection. But it's really up to to the guide or the ranger and the tracker to not get you into a situation that, you know, you would be faced with a danger or where you'd have to use your rifle but in saying that you know you don't always have the opportunity to see the game from um, you know two three hundred meters away and approach them sometimes you could be just driving on the road through thick bush and an elephant can come out or a lion can be you know just lying on the road or you know it depends on on the on the species but a lot of the time you would just make use of the vehicle. So your your biggest option is just to just drive away from the animal if it allows you. Because I was going to say, you'd have to be a pretty crack shot, wouldn't you, to stop a an elephant with a rifle? 100%. Um, and, you know, your, your main objective there is the guest protection. So if you have to shoot from a sitting position behind a steering wheel and to try you know shoot that elephant in the correct spot to to bring it down with one shot that you have to be incredibly lucky or an incredibly good shot so in that opportunity the best thing is to um you know just try drive away as 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 quick and as safe as you can donovan thanks for your time today um Hopefully we haven't scared people off today on going on safari. Um, Probably just a little bit more interesting to get an appreciation of how powerful and wild these animals are and how quickly things can go wrong. Having said that, though, um, it sounds incredibly amazing. And um, if people 
don't intervene and follow what um, you guys do, it sounds like it can be a, an amazing experience and is an amazing experience. Um, thank you very much for your time today, Donovan. Well, thank you, and 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 thank you for allowing me to to come and have a chat to everybody. And that's one hundred percent. If if you ever have dreamt of it, or you know, there's any be, been any thoughts in your mind, I would definitely, definitely take up the opportunity to go to Africa. There are thousands of game reserves out there, and uh, you know, for all types of budget, you don't have to go to the expensive, over the top game reserves. I would definitely. If it's a lifelong dream, make it happen. So, Donovan, we obviously can't name all of them, but some of the ones that you worked at, could you give us a plug? And I'll make sure that I put the links um, on both the Instagram site as well as um, in the blurb for the podcast. Well, I think the one, you know, some of them are that are in the Sabi Sands. Uh, the one that I worked at is called Sabi Sabi. And that is a fantastic, amazing um, property, uh, absolutely stunning, stunning lodges, your high-end um, lodges. And then uh, the other property, which is also really, really fantastic, a large property, one of the most picturesque properties we worked on, and that is a property called Valgefonden, which is also amazing uh, property. But out there they are really really pretty ones thanks again for your time donovan and we wish you all the best thanks so much and have a good evening thanks for listening today we're glad you could join us for more information on today's episode previous episodes and upcoming episodes please go to at the barefax podcast on instagram also our YouTube channel, The Bare Facts Podcast with Ross Pollard, as well as Facebook, The Bare Facts. And please get in contact with us. If you are an extraordinary person, you know an extraordinary person, or you've been in an extraordinary situation.